Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. My guest today is Dr. Monika Anderson, or Dr. Mo, as she uh, she goes by. Uh, she is she is and does many things. She uh, She's a, a dentist. She's been a best-selling author, podcast host. She's a dynamic, motivational speaker, a cancer survivor, and leader of a nonprofit organization, Drop the Drugs, Inc. So she's been featured in, in many media outlets, uh, including nationally, Parade Magazine, uh, Fox News, Good Morning Texas, because we are Texans. So before I tell you a little bit more uh, about Dr. Mo, first off, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hey, Mark. Good morning. I am awesome. Thank you for having me on the program. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's great to have you here and to learn from you today. Now, you, you are Texan through and through, born and raised, right? Yes, sir. Born and raised. I was born in Houston, grew up in Fort Worth, Cowtown, Funky Town. It's known by many names, but (laughs) I consider that home. And uh, I've lived in other areas, but I have uh, spent most of my life in Texas. I've spent most of my adult life in Texas. Uh, Mm -hmm. Not not being born there wasn't my fault. It wasn't a mistake, but (laughs) um, I've, I've, I've lived around different parts of Texas. So good to have a Texan um, on the podcast. So, uh, Dr. Mo um, has published, uh, writ- written many books, including uh, a novel, Never Close Your Heart, and her most recent book, and we'll, we'll delve into things like this, um, a nonprofit, or not a nonprofit, nonfiction book, my most recent mistake there, sorry, nonfiction <laughs> book, Launch Your Self-Publishing Journey, The Busy Author's Guide to Write, Publish, and Sell your book fast. And uh, Dr. Mo is host of a podcast called Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. So her website, and there'll be uh, a link into the show notes, uh, drmoanderson.com, M-O-E. So um, to that real quick, though, as we get to know you a little bit before we hear your favorite mistake story, uh, going from uh, Monica uh, to Mo, and then maybe uh, the more interesting story is how you started spelling it Lowercase m, capital O, lowercase e. Uh, yeah, it is. It is an interesting story. And um, as you said, my name is Monica, but it's spelled like Monica, M-O-N-I-C-A. I prefer the pronunciation Monica. That was my mom's intention. Mm-hmm. And so that's first kind of the way I know people who really know me as opposed to people who don't, because if they say Monica, they don't know uh, me. Right. So. I go off to college at Baylor and I'm Monica and, you know, people are visual. They see the name. We had the little name tags on there at the beginning. Hell week, I call it. I don't know what they called it at Baylor, but we (laughs) we were getting traumatized as incoming freshmen in the, in the most polite Protestant way. Yeah. But uh, there was one guy who just could not get with Monica. Right. It just, Mm -hmm. he was like, mama, mama, mama. And finally he said, I'm going to call you Mo. At that time, there were about 10,000 students there, very small community. And I'll say within two hours, everyone was calling me Mo because that was so much easier than tripping over how to say my name. Yeah. Went with that for a while, just capital M-O-E. And then uh, Perpetual Motion is the app name of my podcast because I like doing a lot of things. I I just have a gift for that, for doing multiple things. And so I'm always busy. And I had a website guy working on my first website way back in the day. It was one page, one long page with, you remember that with a few few blocks here and there. And we were emailing constantly and I'm the queen of typos. That's the other thing that people need to know about me is that I don't like Grammarly because for text, because it changes my intent. I like it for writing my books and I accidentally capitalized the O and it went off to him. I didn't even notice. And he came back. He was branding before branding was cool. And he was like, hey, I like that. Did you do that on purpose? I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I saw it. And he said, go with it. Let's do it. It sets you apart. Here we are 20, 30 years later. It's still MOE. And, and once people get to know me, that is even how they address me in emails and texts and everything. So that's all it is, just a type of. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's that's perfect for this show that the origin of it, I did not know before um, I asked you um, that the origin of it was was a mistake. I mean, so along the lines of, hey, uh, quick reminders, we're all human. Uh, yes. Sometimes, you know, we have we, we have little slip ups. I mean, I, I wrote a blog post the other day. I typed the word mistake a lot. 
And some, mm-hmm. and I'm a good typist. My fingers get confused and I, and, and it's <laughs> ironic. I misspell the word mistake. It's not an intentional thing I'm doing. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy. And as phones get smaller and smaller, that's, really contributed to my typos because my thumbs, I have a dentist hands. These are large hands for a female. And so as they get smaller and smaller, my thumbs are just hitting stuff. And I'm just like, go with it, read it in context. <laughs> so. Um, so we all make mistakes. We all, we, and sometimes, yeah, we have tools to find or fix those. Um, but the, the other thing I was just going to point out before we get to your story, I, you know, as a host, the last thing I want to do is mispronounce somebody's name uh, mm-hmm. or at any time. And uh, so that's part of the purpose of uh, doing a pre-call is uh, so I can double check and, and, and make sure, you know, I, I, I hope this never happens to you where uh, somebody welcomes you to the show and calls you Monica the whole time. I'm like, do you, like, oh, that puts you in a bad position. Do you jump in and correct them or, or gosh, what do you do? You know, I don't, I, I would have to say inherently the Mo and Monica is part of my identity. And I yeah. think that's what people don't understand when they just decide they're going to call you something else or abbreviate your name. I have a friend named James. He wants to be James. That was his dad's name. He doesn't want to be Jim. Mm-hmm. So I think you you shouldn't take liberties with someone else's property. You know, sure. that that's my name. That's what I want to be called. Now, if I'm at Starbucks or wherever, and they say whatever is fine. But if we're going to have an entire conversation or we're going to be connected in a work relationship or whatever, I'll just gently correct them until they get it. Sometimes mm-hmm. some people do better with visual. I'll, yeah. you know, show them phonetically how it is and then they get it. But I typically, if they introduce me incorrectly, I'll just, when I get up, I'll say, Hey, everybody, I'm Mo Anderson and just kind of leave it at that. Yeah, I guess there's a, you find the, you, you probably get enough practice of the subtle way of re, like reintroducing yourself, um, Monica, yes. or like you say, Mo. Um, so. And you're lucky, you got that one syllable name. It's, it's, I'm thinking it's hard to mess up, Mark. <laughs> Where it's, I, I, I think it was at Starbucks recently and they asked, is that with a C? Like, no, it's with a K. I mean, okay. I, I would answer, it sounds the same. I would have answered to it. Right. Just nice the same. they asked. <laughs> um, Anderson is easy. Graben, my, my last name is, is, is only six letters, but it's easy to misspell or my, my wife says my family says it wrong. So um, oh. <laughs> Gra- Graben okay. instead of um, the alternatives or variations people come up with. But um, so anyway, Dr. Mo, um, you know, I would love to hear of, I'm, I'm, I'm curious of all the different things you've done professionally, um, different environments and, and different work, um, you know, reflecting on it, what would you say is your favorite mistake? My favorite mistake, uh, and I have many mistakes, <laughs> and I, I think uh, I, I've learned to share those and my vulnerabilities because it just shows the humanness in me, and that's where we connect on that on that basic human level. But I um, work work wise. I've worked in a lot of different uh, practice settings. I've been a dentist since 1988, 34 years. And I had my own practice. My kids um, went off to college and I was an empty nester and private practice is is not easy. There's it's physically, emotionally quite, quite draining. And I'd had rotator cuff surgery, things going on with my eyes, all of that. I decided I was going to do something different and being on call constantly. I mean, I have mad respect for my friends who are still in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And I went and I I found this position. I moved to Austin, found a position that was nice, working for a foundation who provided site-based dentistry in these huge mobile clinics for kids in uh, elementary school at Title IX. I can't recall what it is, but uh, lower uh, socioeconomic at-risk underserved populations. And my heart is with you know, serving the community. So it fit on that level. Mm -hmm. But for someone who's been doing veneers and whitening and crowns and implants to now be on a small mobile clinic with screaming children all day. (sighs) Yeah. So (laughs) I did that. Not what you expected, or I guess you didn't realize how that was really going to, how you were going to handle that. or No, I didn't think that through. So I got real skilled at at calming young people because we were asking them to come onto a van. Everything you tell your kids not to do, Mark, come onto a vehicle with a stranger 
wearing a mask and let them touch you. So there's nothing about right. that, that right. a child wants to do. And so, I, you know, my pedo friends, I was constantly calling them about behavior management techniques. How do we do this? Yeah. So I had gotten to the point where I thought, you know what? I think I need to be back with adults. I've led, been part of multidisciplinary teams, led multi multidisciplinary teams, worked in public health. And I, I was thinking, you know, I was putting some feelers out there. And I got a call from a recruiter. I'd never been called by a recruiter. That's not something that really happens in dentistry. That's other corporate type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, I I heard about you at Temp somewhere when I first moved to Austin. They said, you're an awesome speaker and a good clinician. And I've got a client who needs someone like you, but it's for uh, benefits administration insurance. I knew insurance from the submitting claim form side. I didn't know anything about the reviewing and approving or denying. And so I I don't like to limit myself, but I said, I I don't know that I can, maybe I could do it, but I don't know about me being the leader, the director. He goes, no, you're great. You can learn that what you have, your ability to speak, your ability to bring people together. We can't, you know, you can't teach somebody that. And I kept asking who, who is this client? Cause the money was good. And I was going to have this big corner office and I could hire my own team. I'm like, who does this? Who is this client? But he, he just, he drew me in with all the benefits and the uh, things I'd be able to do, right. The, you know, protocols, policies, be on these committees. So I accepted the position without knowing who the client was. They wanted secrecy. Uh, they were based in another state. They didn't want it to get a, a mistake. <laughs> that was yeah. a mistake. And I find out after I signed the contract that the person I had asked who previously held a job and they said he left to do something else. Well, the reason he left, his name was uh, Dr. Jerry Feltner, and I'm not putting him on blast. This was national news. Mm that the uh, Medicaid contract for Texas had been held by this particular organization, TMHP, which was part of Xerox. And he was kind of rubber stamping claims. I I think he was just overwhelmed, but thousands and thousands, particularly orthodontic claims for kids on Medicaid. And some did need it, but the majority had teeth. You have beautiful teeth. My grill is, you know, okay. The majority should not have been approved. And this is all public record. There was a big two, three, four year investigation and trial. So he had to be let go and this contract had to be finished. And here I come in. There were several, multiple investigations going on. The Attorney General, Office of the Inspector General, the news, WFAA was all over it. And there's a, a very, it's not funny, an alarming video of this gentleman on his last day, Dr. Felkner, running to his truck with the media running behind him. Yeah. And that's my new job that I've already committed to. And that's my favorite mistake because it ended up being the hardest and best position of my life. Wow. Um, Wow. Um, So there's a lot to- There's a lot. (laughs) Well, no, and and thank you for sharing all that. So find, you know, you've acknowledged um, the mistake of of signing the contract, not knowing who the client was. I mean, I'm curious your thought process when you realized this, were you thinking, Oh gosh, I should talk to a lawyer and see how solid that can I get out of this contract? Or did you think, well, here's here's my new challenge, like it or not? Like I I did not think about getting out of it. I I prayed about it. I wondered how I was going to get it done because all of a sudden I was inundated with so many things from acronyms to processes to people that I wasn't familiar with and there was no support Mm -hmm. he left nothing no guide there was nothing in writing so it was creating something massive from nothing and so my fear was more failure I'm just Mm -hmm. uh I had made my commitment and I don't turn back on my commitments and I said that's 
That's my fault for not insisting that they tell me who it was. The responsibilities, they actually described somewhat well, leaving out the investigations that were going on yeah. and the fact that I would be deposed somewhat regularly. Mm. But the the job duties were pretty much as they described. And when I got a good team in there, I, I felt like this is doable. And I had to uh, be way more outspoken and assertive and set boundaries because so many people were involved and so much was at stake, but it really uh, made me step up into, you know, the leader that I felt I should have been and had not had to be before because I was in such easy environments, so fluid where I had control over everything. And suddenly I'm in this world where there's so many different stakeholders, so many people with input and so many people over me and now a new team beneath me. But no, I never, I know some people would, but other than not telling me something that I didn't insist on knowing, I couldn't really say that I had been tricked or Uh completely misled. I just didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate, you know, among other things, what I hear you saying, Dr. Mo, is you owning your actions and your decision to take that job instead of blaming the recruiter. Or I'm I'm, I'm curious though, like what did did you we could call it feedback? Did you give some feedback around, well, hey, why why didn't you tell me these things? I'm I'm guessing it wasn't, I mean, what type of mistake? Was it a mistake of the recruiter to not tell you? Did they not know? I mean, gosh. They they knew, but as it turned out, they had, when they had made it public what the position was and who it was for, that they couldn't get applications for the job. Wow. So in, in that sense, I guess there was some intent in hiding it, but I don't know that he was able even able to get into the responsibilities just when he said the name TMHP, because mm-hmm. every dentist in America was aware mm-hmm. of what was going on with this company. And they had, I, I wasn't the only person they reached out to who they were interested in, but I could see why ultimately they were very much wanting someone with good communicative abilities, because that really was the core of the job, yeah. was communicating between all of this divisiveness and so, yes, I did get some feedback of like, you know, I probably would have liked to have known this. And yes, I probably would have declined. So I, I was kind of torn about whether or not who, you know, whose fault it was. He said the client had asked for confidentiality. And as a recruiter, you know, I understand that they have to go with the client's needs. But hmm. again, I, the yeah. position I have today was is with the company that took over that contract when it ended, because it was ending. That was the other thing I should say. I think there were about eight months left before that contract ended. And that was the other part. If I'm doing something difficult and challenging, but I know there's an end to it, like childbirth, (laughs) I I can get through it no matter how hard or painful. I know there's an end to this and I'm going to grow as a person, if I can make it to that end. And that's just the way I, I look at life. That's the way I look at things. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, a, that's, that seems like an important wrinkle of it. Like, Hey, worst case, see it through. And then there was an opportunity. It sounds like then for you to transition over to this company that took over the contract. to Right. To they re- they recruited me mm-hmm. because I had that experience. I mean, I had been in the fire and I had the relationships and love where I am now. So, but I couldn't have gotten here because they needed people with experience and I couldn't have gotten that job that no one else would take because I didn't have the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, I've talked to other people, other guests who have shared some sort of job change stories. There's different Mm -hmm. variations of, it was a mistake to leave. It was a mistake to take this new job. It was a mistake. It would have been a mistake to leave, like one of my other guests, you know, very specifically said Eric Twiggs, that, you know, when he got into a new job that wasn't what he expected, looking back at it, he said it would have been a mistake to bail out on it right away. Would would you go as far as to say, it sounds like you're saying something similar. I would say that. I would say it would have been a mistake to bail out on it. And and to be clear, I wish I'd been more insistent about knowing who the Mm -hmm. client was. Uh, That was a mistake, not knowing I would not do that again. 
Yeah, that's a mistake you can avoid repeating. If you right, can right. It again. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey. We'll be telling me who it is. And then I get to, you know, on my terms with all available information, I get to make that decision. So that that was the mistake. Uh, there was not having all of the information and not insisting on it because I was so caught up in the bells and whistles, the shiny things he was telling me about. Yeah. And, and, and that, I mean, you know, sometimes on, on the podcast here, I think that one mistake is one that others can or should learn from. Don't, don't sign a contract for a job. If they're not telling you who it is, you, that, that might be a red flag. There's a reason, <laughs> right? There's a reason. That's a red flag. Uh, it would be interesting to talk to a, not that recruiter, but um, I'll, I'm going to ask one of my recruiter friends about um, their, their view just off to the side about a situation like that. Cause that, that, I mean, they're in a tough spot, but then they made some decisions that put you in a tough spot. Like they, they had a choice. They could have turned down the work right? with that client requirement of, of confidentiality. And that's their decision. And they would be able to decide if, if they think uh, that's a mistake. But, you know, the different job changes, you know, to kind of recap, like it sounds like not a mistake to leave private practice. But that was that was the right move. That, no, I, at, at that point in my life, that was the right move. Uh, I was able to leave my staff and patients with a, a really, really good doctor, but I wanted, which I did not get with this new job, but I wanted a, a schedule that was uh, gave me a little bit more flexibility and to not be on call morning, noon, and night because I was in private practice. So back, you know, from the beeper to the phone to the various iterations we went through of ways to you know, find your healthcare provider, it was never ending. And that was starting to drain on me with having a family and everything. Yeah. And then just, you know, fi final question on, you know, everything you had shared with us, Dr. Mo, like leaving that small mobile clinic, was that, was that an easy decision when you realized, okay, this is not what you wanted? It, it was not easy because they were doing such really great work. Yeah. And uh, the kids we would see with, you know, rampant decay or with that, you know, the nurse was often sending us kids like, I know it's not time for this classroom, but this kid has come to school for three days with their face swollen. I love I'm, everything I do is about helping people, whether I'm, you know, empowering them a value to their daily journey, their thought process, their mindset, or literally, you know, helping them heal as I've been able to do or, or creating the environment for healing. The body heals is my belief, but we can create that environment. So, and, and I really liked my uh, teammates who I was working with, yeah. but it just wasn't well suited to me in terms of uh, the crying. It was just a lot of crying, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but the, the, and, yeah, the, and, but, you know, the, the, the commitment to the mission and the purpose comes through right. really strong. And, you know, I think it's, I, I'm still trying to figure out how to think through things like this, where, um, you know, there might be a situation where you'd say, well, it might be a mistake to leave. It might be a mistake to stay. I don't know until I either, I, I, I decide one way or another. I mean, right. it, life is, it, there are tough decisions. Um, that 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 people get into. Yeah. There are, there are, and I, I want, I want to be a good fit for the environment, and I want, you know, whatever organization it is to have people that it's a good fit for, because you shouldn't have, you know, stress and anxiety. There, it is inherent with almost anything, but not all day long. Yeah. If that's how you live, and then I think that's a mistake. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question I was going to ask you later, but I think it connects to this idea of, um, you know, serving others and purpose and mission. Mm -hmm. Before I come back, I've got a, a dentistry question and we talk about your book you. publishing, <laughs> but um, the nonprofit that you lead, uh, Drop the Drugs, Inc. Tell, tell us a little bit about that and the, the mission and the purpose. Absolutely. Um, back in 2018, <clears throat> I was accepted into a program that the American Dental Association does the Institute for Diversity in Leadership. Uh, dentistry has long been a male-dominated profession, white male-dominated profession, and now the majority of the graduates from most professional schools, dental school, medical school, law school, are females. Uh -huh. And so they are actively working, you know, when it comes to the leadership management positions to get more uh, people of color 
uh, different genders, different ages into leadership positions in their communities and local dental societies. So I get into this program with about 20 dentists from across the country. And you have to write an essay saying uh, about a community service initiative you'll do when you go back to your community. That's that's the point. Mm -hmm. And mine was that I became aware that 24-7, you can drop off unused prescriptions, unused medications, expired medications, things you don't need to keep in your home that are contributing to addiction, Mm -hmm. poisoning, and overdose. People know take back day, Mm -hmm. October and April, but you can go to local pharmacies, local hospitals, local law enforcement, and anonymously get rid of those drugs, get them out of your home, a parent died, you've got a box full of stuff. And so I wanted to make my community more aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I came up with a plan. We had business professors talk to us from the leading business schools in the nation. We would go up quarterly to Chicago and meet. And that was mine, drop the drugs. And I've kept it going. I ended up incorporating working with local law enforcement, the DEA over in Dallas. And the first two years that we worked with the law enforcement here in Grand Prairie, they actually tripled their take back simply by raising awareness, talking about it, giving out information, going to community events. And it's been really, really exciting. We have a big event coming up in October. We're going to do a film screening about a, a character who gets caught up in uh, drug misuse after the loss of a family member, great volunteers and a board. And it's just in keeping with my mission of improving overall wellness for my community. Yeah. Well, Thanks thank for, for asking about that. Well, well, thank you for raising awareness there because let, let's say like a scenario, common one, is, you know, you have some sort of procedure, they give you a couple of pain pills or, you know, just in case. And, and, mm-hmm. and I think they, 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 they have to, maybe this is law of, uh, they give you a, a smaller quantity than they right. might have in the past, but it's as, as a reminder for people, um, it's a mistake to put those drugs down the drain or just throw them out in the trash. Can right. That's pharmaceutical. More, yeah. Yeah. Pharmaceutical. Okay. You know, what can, can you just kind of summarize for people why um, we want to avoid the mistake of not giving, um, you know, taking taking pharmaceuticals to the proper disposal location. Yeah, well, what they're finding, and if people visit our website at dropthedrugs.org, there's a lot more information about this, but it's seeping into the groundwater. It's going, you know, from the trash, the dump, the fields, the landfills, it's going into down the toilet, down the drain, and traditional wastewater treatment does not remove all of this from our water. And so between our natural waste and us constantly flushing those things down, they are finding more than trace amounts of antibiotics, ADD drugs, painkillers for the people who are trying to get rid of them. And I did it in the past as well. That's literally what they told us to do. But we're finding it in our water that's coming into our homes for us to drink and bathe in uh, animals. We're seeing changes in the animals, in the wildlife, in the fish, all of this is just coming back and being recycled in a way that we don't need. We don't need to have antibiotics and, you know, ADHD drugs in our drinking water. So it's better to take them to these places where they dispose of them. They've got a whole system to keep it contained, even the smoke that uh, arises from the incineration so that it's not going back into the air, into the water, into yeah. the soil. Great question. Thank you. Good. So again, dropthedrugs.org if you want to learn more about that. So I, I did want to ask you a question, Dr. Mo, thinking back to you know, dentistry, um, even generally speaking, not specifically you mm-hmm. know, uh, your, your, yourself, but I think it's interesting. You know, I've had other um, medical providers on the podcast, anesthesiologists and, and, and nurses. We know the impact in a lot of settings of, of medical mistakes can be really harmful. Um, how are dentists taught either in school or in, in, in their first jobs about um, you know, uh, dealing with possible mistakes of, of preventing them? Um, what, what, what's some of the education or the, the, the best practice related to mistakes that could occur? Sure, sure. And, and uh, mistakes happen. We're human, um, you know, whether it's an allergic reaction because a patient didn't 
know they were allergic to something or they forgot to tell you I can't take Tylenol to something you prescribed or an injection into an artery instead of into the muscle or I've had this happen. It was terrifying. I'm doing a crown prep on this elderly lady and she jumped and grabbed my hand all of a sudden. And uh, when you've got a stainless steel uh, burr, carbide burr going yeah. thousands of rotations a minute and you do that, nothing good is going to come of that. Mm. And so uh, things, yes, things happen. Nitrous, that there's so many things that thank goodness people don't know. That's why dentists are terrible patients because we know all the stuff that can happen. And wonderfully, 99% of the time they don't. But what we are taught in school, and I just took an ethics course literally yesterday, what we are reminded of as we do our continuing education is to do no harm. Mm -hmm. But if something happens, we need to give full disclosure to the patient and do everything we can to remedy it. Remedy. Yeah the problem, either refer them to the proper person. It may be called 911. It may be send them to a specialist. Uh, it may be a prescription. It may be sutures. It may be a temporary and you got to come back later. But the big thing is to not hide it. Uh -huh. uh, and the temptation is there because yeah. we're human and everybody's thinking about getting sued. Mm -hmm. but to let them know, and, and you sign, if you look at the papers you sign before we work on you, they list, yeah. you know, the possible, just like any surgery, the possible things that can happen. So yeah, just to, just to make it right and to admit it and to try to make it right, do everything you can to make it right. Yeah. And I'd be curious. I mean, I, I might guess similar thing might happen in dental care. Um, I've seen studies in, let's say hospital medicine, if there's mm -hmm. a mistake, a preventable error, that when there's disclosure and an apology, um, the patient or the family are actually far less likely to sue. That a lot of times the legal action comes out of frustration of mm -hmm. like, we know something went wrong. You're not telling us anything. People figure out and then they get upset and then they get litigious. Yeah. All the research shows that that communication is the big factor. In fact, I mean, on a very basic level, people are less likely to sue a provider that they like. Mm -hmm. It's just friendly. Even if the work mm -hmm. is crappy, they just they like the person. <laughs> sure. So being personable, uh, taking your time with people, not being abrupt, you know, that cheer side manner. And then when people know that when they you can feel when somebody's really interested in you, when they're, you know, trying to do their best. And I think we all understand I've had mistakes made on me medically. I mean, I'm a cancer patient. I've had two major surgeries and I, I had a provider at a major institution make a huge mistake on me that I ended up in the ER, but oh gosh. our experience overall had been great. So I wasn't inclined to sue him. I changed providers, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I wasn't inclined to sue him because of our relationship. Yeah. And then there's always the question then of, did they learn from the mistake to put right. something in place to prevent reoccurrence. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but like when it comes to dentistry, I was at the dentist um, the other day, just for a cleaning and a checkup. And, you know, I think of times I, I, I'm guessing, uh, let me ask it as a question. Are, are there, you know, some procedures in place to make sure that um, let's say they don't drill into the wrong tooth by mistake, um, kind of a simple, just a oops, if you will, how, how are things like that prevented? Yeah, we have team huddles in the morning before we work on patients to talk about what we're going to do. You know, you've got your assistant and yourself multiple times. You're looking at records. You're looking at x-rays. Many providers will ask, ask the uh, patient, do you know what we're doing? Do you know which tooth we're working on? Because sometimes patients are mistaken about what we're doing and yeah. where, and the teeth are numbered. And I remember I had a dyslexic assistant who went, she didn't tell me she was dyslexic. She almost got fired and then she admitted it, but uh, he mixed up number 13 and number 31, things like uh, that. Boy. Those are two yeah. totally different teeth in two yeah. totally different areas. So yeah, we had to move her to another position that didn't, <laughs> didn't require being in charge of numbers, but that was my first year of having my practice. So. Uh, yeah, that was funny. I forgot about her. She's a sweetie. But yes, there are a number of steps in there in, in any healthcare environment to try to prevent those things from happening. But again, if they do, for whatever reason, 
the onus is on you to do everything you can to let them know and to correct it. Yeah. And like you say, I mean, you know, we're all human. That includes doctors, dentists, surgeons, veterinarians, but um, you know, we do what we can to do right by people, you know, preventing errors or learning from them when they do occur. And, you know, I think, you know, not blaming individuals, Mm -hmm. you know, when, when there's, um, you know, there's certain errors that happen so many times in so many different places. Like it, it just, it screams uh, systemic error. And um, I, I think being aware of that helps a lot. Right. I'll get down off my soapbox about. Um, no, I like your soapbox. <laughs> uh, standard operating procedures, processes, mm-hmm. policies. We're very detail oriented in, in the industry. Even the tray, the instruments are always laid out in the same way. They're turned in the same direction. All of those things are not just for efficiency, but also to, uh, you know, help prevent mistakes. Yeah. So you're speaking my language there. Um, well, that's good. Uh, my my engineering attention to detail. I, I got I, I got asked the other day, um, new primary care provider, um, do you have any medication allergies? And and I thought the only honest answer was none that I'm aware of. Right. I haven't been given every single medication to know if I'm allergic. So um, I guess those details maybe matter, or they just roll their eyes. Like just say no. I don't. <laughs> I don't think they rolled their eyes at me. Somebody might. Um, well, you, you're being honest and, and engineers and attorneys, I came to expect those types of responses <laughs> because <laughs> down to the kernel of the truth. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. that is actually the correct answer. Yeah. Do you know if you're allergic to anything? Well, what what, what does the word no? Mean? Right. I'm not a lawyer, but I, w- I won't do that. But um, of, of all the things you are, Dr. Mo, I want to ask you a little bit about um, being an author and I'd be curious to hear, like, I, I, like, I'm only a nonfiction person. I only read and I only write nonfiction. You've, you've written novels, you've written some nonfiction, including a book about writing a book. I, I'd be curious to hear some of your interests and in evolution, um, you know, of, of doing different types of writing. Well, I, I come from a family of griots and uh, storytellers, and my mother had 14 siblings, and they all had lots of children. So really in our family, you had to be a good storyteller and engaging or you would not get the floor. You were not going to get to talk. If you were boring, you were going to be cut out immediately. You had to be animated and laughing and reeling everybody in. So that's my background. I've always uh, loved language, particularly writing since I was a kid. I was born a writer. I became a dentist and everything else later, but I was born a writer and uh, my first book was actually on uh, Black English vernacular, and that just came about because I'd moved to Minnesota, and I realized that so many things that I thought, you know, I'd lived in Texas up until that point, mm-hmm. so I thought everyone kind of used, you know, these expressions, these idioms, these different pronunciations of Detroit or Detroit, the mm-hmm. emphasis on the E, Yeah, and so I kind of wrote a book about it. And it was right before that situation in Oakland when they were trying to teach Ebonics in the school. Mm. So the book just blew up and I toured all over the country. And honestly, it was horrible because we were just arguing with people all the time. Now, now people have calmed down and and Ebonics is everywhere from commercials to TV scripts to everywhere. But at that time, people lost their minds. So I thought, Mm. I don't want to do that anymore. And (laughs) I started writing fiction and creative nonfiction, had a column in a newspaper that led to my first kind of fiction book. And it was an escape. I mean, I was practicing dentistry, which is very intense, very cerebral. And to be able to write books where I just created characters, created words, worlds, created dialogue was great fun for me. And it's a billion dollar industry because it's great fun for a lot of people to read. And then I got, um, I wrote uh, three or four novels. They did well, had a national bestseller. The others had some success. But then I got cancer. I mentioned before that I have a a cancer. I have a rare form of cancer. uh, And Hmm. that kind of changed my mindset. And I wrote uh, this book, Success is a Side Effect. Yeah. Because uh, really for my children, but for anyone who's trying to figure this thing out about the mistakes, the challenges, the journey. And I really just want this thing. Why are all these other things happening to me? My my 
overarching thing to say to them is that when you are more focused on trying to make a difference than trying to make a dollar, success is a side effect. Mm -hmm. And all those detours, those bumps in the road, all those, you know, hurdles are preparing you for the next great thing that you're going to do, but just pursue your passions and in a powerful focused way. And you'll see the other things, whatever else it is you're looking for, the accolades, the money, all of that will come. But you look at Mother Teresa, you look at people like that. They weren't just out trying to be an influencer and get a whole bunch of likes. They were out trying to make a difference in people's lives, like you're doing here. I mean, people need to know you're not the only one making a mistake. You know? Right. And while we could... overcoming challenges. Yeah. Well, and we, and we couldn't spread that message without guests like you, you know, coming and sharing your stories. And I think setting, you know, a very good example um, for others. And so, th- so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, before I wrap up, I, I wanted to ask one other question about, you know, your most recent book and, and this idea of not just writing and not just being an author, but self-publishing. Like personally, I've made that transition from writing and having a publisher publish mm-hmm. it to doing my own publishing. What was was that part of your journey as well? Or what what advice would you give to to authors about that? Absolutely. I've had a traditional publishing experience. I've done the hybrid where you kind of pay a company to do, you know, most of the legwork after you've written the book. And then I went to self-publishing when I got into novels because I mean they want you to have an audience. They want you to bring all these people. They want you to, you know, not get paid, but every six months. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this myself. Yeah. And so I wrote the book you alluded to, and I'm sorry, I didn't answer that earlier. Launch Your Self-Publishing uh-huh. Journey with Dr. Stoller, Masudi Stollard, who's also multiple published. And, and uh-huh. to be honest, it was because since I'd written multiple books, everyone who wanted to write a book came to ask me uh-huh. questions, not realizing this was happening several times a month. And I could not have lunch with everybody and right. look at their manuscripts and answer their questions over and over and over as much as I'd like to. And, and I'm proud to say that a number of the people that I coached and counsel have their have written their own book, have written multiple books. But I thought, let's put this in an easy to read, user friendly, step by step guide and allow people, you know, to write their own books and to publish it. Mm -hmm. Because it can be done. And a lot of those companies out there, as you know, they mark up everything, Mm -hmm. whether it's the copyright, the editing, the graphic artist. And with so many contractors online now, Upworks, Fiverr, it's just it's not that hard to get people who are experienced and professional. Don't Good. don't get your yeah. buddy who right. just, right. you know, has Adobe, just got it on their PC and they say they can do it for you or right. your friend who teaches English. So we talk about all of that, how to select an editor, how to get a professional cover, how to make sure you secure your intellectual property without doing a poor man's copyright. And it's, you know, we've gotten really great feedback. We priced it at $3.99 for the paper bag. I don't, I, I think the uh, ebook is almost free. Mm-hmm. But again, just passing it forward, helping more people realize their dream of becoming an authority, an expert, a go to person. And when you get through speaking something at the back of the room, yes, you know, another stream of income. There are so many reasons uh, to, to, to write a book. And yeah, I, I, I I get asked, you know, by people, and I, I try to be helpful, but it's, you're right. Sometimes you feel like you're repeating the same, um, you know, kind of, uh, if you will, advice. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I mean, I, I, I've, I've done both. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, cr- I'm going to check out your book, by the way, because I've done this, but I don't have it all figured out. So, you know, I'm, I'm writing currently a book based on, you know, stories and themes from this podcast. Oh, that's going to be good. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, I need to, to figure, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to get, I'm, I know some tips from your book, but uh, what I was going to say there was, um, you know, I, I, I intend on self-publishing it. Like I wouldn't go so far to say it's a mistake to work through a publisher. I think there are pros and cons, but Absolutely. I think it would be a mistake to not investigate self-publishing. Mm-hmm. Do you agree or what would you say? I, I agree. And even the process of learning about self-publishing will help you work with a publisher better. I tell people that all the time because you need to understand the steps. You need to understand the questions 
to ask. You need to understand the process, why it takes so long so you're not impatient about it because there are things you submit, you have to wait for, you're waiting on contractors. This is not the only project that they're working on, but also what's a reasonable time frame, a reasonable expectation. But I, I, if I'm, you know, I don't know everything about plumbing, but when the guy was here the other day replacing my old ring, I knew enough to ask <laughs> to ask a few questions. Right. It, it made me feel more comfortable with what he was doing and that he knew what he was doing because really anyone can call themselves a publisher. Yeah. There's no special credential or, or organization that you have to be a part of. There's some you can be a part of, but a lot of sm- small publisher would, Publishers were authors who decided, you know what, I'm going to do this and charge people and help other people. Yeah. So there are different mistakes that could be made along the way. I'm sure your book will help steer people away from some of those mistakes. So, um, Dr. Mo, if I can throw this in, I will. We've developed a checklist from it, and I have a a free chapter that I'd be happy to share with you. I'll send you links and and you can share that with your listeners. I will do that. Thank you. I will put a link to that in the show notes and encourage people to go um, buy the book. So uh, Dr. Mo, again, Dr. Monika Anderson, uh, her website, uh, drmoanderson.com. And uh, again, the podcast, um, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but go check it out uh, wherever you're listening to this podcast, Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson, the uh, M-O-E-T-I-O-N, Perpetual Motion. Yes, um, so I, I can see where that end comes from. You've uh, done a lot. You're doing a lot. You have a lot to share. So thank you for being here today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. You're awesome. Continued success to you, Mark.